Well, talking about the battle from Little Round Top, and usually where I start is I start down here. When you talk about July 2nd, you're most associated with certain core and certain core badges. Certainly up here on Little Round Top, the Maltese Cross of the 5th Corps, or you'll see the Greek Cross of the 6th Corps. Down there in the wheat field and along this line, you'll see the Diamond of the 3rd Corps. You'll also see the Trefoil of the 2nd Corps. But one symbol on Little Round Top makes absolutely no sense with the context of everything on July 2nd, unless you know the story. That's that one, right there. The five-pointed star of the 12th Army Corps. So the question is, when did the 12th Army Corps come to Little Round Top? Well, let's walk to the other side of this little monument. This is the monument, the 147th Pennsylvania Infantry. They're telling you they were here, along with flank markers, on the night of July 1st. So let's roll this back a little bit. July 1st is when the Battle of Gettysburg starts. And to put it mildly, it does not go well for the Union forces. The Confederates bring more troops to bear. They outflank the Union position both north and west of town and drive them back through town. All right. The Union forces are going to assemble on the heights south of town on a hill with a cemetery on it, where they will be met by Winfield Scott Hancock. Winfield Scott Hancock, the commander of the Second Corps, had been sent by George Meade to assess the situation and to act in his stead. Hancock looks at the situation, will help to rally the forces up there, and will send an assessment back to Meade saying, the position they now occupy is strong, but it can be easily turned on the left. What does that mean? Well, the left, of course, for those of you who are baseball fans, left field, left, the left of the line, he's saying can be easily turned, meaning, say this is the end of the line, that enemy forces can come in, flank it, and get behind. To guard against this, they put Buford's Cavalry Division, which has done some incredible service that day already. They placed them out here at the Peach Orchard, just west of us, or near that area. They're there to guard the Emsburg Road, to protect the wagon trains of the Third Corps that's coming up, and kind of to be that flank protection for the Union Army on the left side. The other force they put up here is John Geary's division of the 12th Corps. Now Geary's division, they will not build fortifications. We're not even certain they go into a defensive posture or a defensive line. We think they go in by column of regiments, which is stacked on one top of the other, in that column, up in this general vicinity. The 147th Pennsylvania will tell you they were exactly here. Okay, with that, take that with a grain of salt. Veterans are, they would know where they're at, but you have to keep in mind they're placing these monuments maybe 20 or 30 years after the fact. So things could have changed. So it's not probably not the exact location, maybe it is, but it's in the general area. But they're here from the night of July 1st into the morning of July 2nd. But before dawn, or at dawn, they are pulled, Geary's division, is pulled from here to go to Culp's Hill. See this road that runs by here? That's the Wheatfield Road, and it connects to the Tawny Town Road. They would utilize that to get over and use the Blacksmith Shop Road in order to get over to Culp's Hill, where they will start building fortifications and Geary and one of his brigade commanders are going to have a debate about the efficacy of building fortifications, but that's a story for a different day. They're going to see the bulk of their fighting on July 2nd and July 3rd over there. So, but Geary's division and where they were plays a part in there being a battle at Little Round Top. Because Geary's men, having put taken off of this hill, are sent to Culp's Hill, and they're going to be forming the barb or the sharp end of the fish hook line. Okay, well, fish hook line. 
It'll be the 12th Corps, 11th and 1st will occupy Cemetery Hill. 2nd Corps will occupy the raised piece of ground coming from Cemetery Hill down off of south. That's the 2nd Corps. They're going to be occupying basically towards the Pennsylvania, Monument, the Pennsylvania Memorial over there. And the 3rd Corps, which has arrived during the night, is to occupy on the right. They're connecting with the left flank of the 2nd Corps. And according to General Meade, their left flank is supposed to rest on Little Round Top. And according to me, where Geary's division was. There's only a problem. General Daniel Sickles, the commander of the Third Corps, claims he doesn't know where that was, or is unclear about that. Geary, as far as we know, didn't leave a staff officer behind to really direct Sickles into position. But I think there's a bigger issue with Sickles that morning. Sickles looks at the position that he's assigned, and if you want to turn around, you'll get a view of some of the position that he's told to occupy. Some of it might be ideal for artillery platform, but a lot of it is kind of low, rocky, marshy ground, extending on that way down Cedric Avenue. He doesn't like his position. So, he starts advocating to move out to a position he thinks is better which is a raised piece of ground along the Emmitsburg Road. I think Sickles tunnel visions. He's going to, he knows what he wants to do. He's concerned about where he's occupying here. He's not certain where Geary's division was. So he's looking at a position he thinks is better. And that is in essence what happens is he then makes the decision to move his core out to that new position uncovering Little Round Top and establishing a new federal line. Awesome. So, yeah, there you go. Thanks, Mike. Talk about Geary's. He's a good dude. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the the morning of July 2nd is also important, not only for the Union and Geary's division getting off of the hill, but also because Robert E. Lee has determined that if the Union Army is here in the morning on July 2nd, he's going to attack them. So he's going to spend much of the morning trying to figure that out because guess what? The Union Army stays. And so he's trying to find, figure out what's the best way to actually attack the Army of the Potomac here. And while Hancock had said that the position was vulnerable on the left, that's one of the areas that Lee is focusing his attention, is on the Union left. How is he going to attack that? Jeb Stewart is not with him, not at this time. He won't arrive until late on July 2nd. So Lee doesn't have his chief information gatherer available to him. So he's going to start sending out different reconnaissance parties during the morning in order to find out, okay, what are the dispositions of the Union forces? And what does the terrain look like? One of those reconnaissance parties is under Captain Samuel Johnston, a engineer on his staff who's fulfilling a role on his staff that he fulfilled on Winfield Scott's staff during the Mexican War, chiefly as a reconnaissance officer and as a person who assesses terrain. So that's what he's going to require of Johnston. Johnston's going to have to come out here, assess the Union left, and determine the terrain. Johnston will leave about four o'clock somewhere in that neighborhood in the morning on July 2nd, and he'll come up here, or at least he claims he comes up here, looks around, goes back down, and meets with Lee later on in the morning. Now, if you can imagine, this is a great view. Look at this. You can see everything from here. So what he's going to do is he's going to return back to Lee's headquarters, or at least where Lee is. And Lee is going to ask him, did he get here? In which Johnson will say, yes, he did. The next question is absolutely important. Are there any Union forces, not, he didn't phrase it this way, any Union forces in this area? Johnston said, no. Which is curious, considering that depending on when he was up here, he might have seen Geary's division here. He certainly would have seen out there 
possibly cavalry patrols. He does claim he saw cavalrymen out there on the Emmitsburg Road. But the overall message is clear. There's no one occupying this ground. To this day, people actually write articles, bash each other on social media, have endless debates at the Reliance Mine Saloon in, in here in Gettysburg. Did Johnston actually get to Little Round Top? And for me, it's kind of a silly debate because it's not whether he got here or not. It's what he said to Lee that matters. He said that there was no one here. So Lee formulates his attack plan for that morning, which is James Longstreet with two divisions. See that distant tree line over there with that ridge? Is supposed to conceal himself behind that distant tree line and that ridge, not the mountains. He's not going that far. But to use that ridge line out there under concealment, not to be noticed by Union forces, to cross over the Millerstown Emmitsburg Road crossroads with one division, and that's going to be McClaws's division. To use the Emmitsburg Road as a guide moving up. John Bell Hood's division is to come alongside and they're supposed to start moving north. Their objective from that point is not this hill. Their objective is that hill with the blue water tower on it and with the, the tombstones of the National Cemetery. Cemetery Hill. That's the key to the entire position. That's the key to the entire Union position. What they're trying to do is what Hancock was afraid of. They're trying, well not afraid of, but concerned about. Don't, don't ever say Hancock was afraid. People will come after you, pitchforks and knives, wearing trifoil hat. They're going to move up and try to outflank that position. So when Longstreet, now he's going to argue about this, quibble about this. He wants Pickett's division as well. But Pickett's still on the road from Chambersburg to the west. He's not going to arrive until the afternoon of July 2nd. So Lee says no on that one. Hood's division's not complete because Law's Alabamans haven't arrived yet. And so Longstreet argues, okay, then at least let me wait for Law. And Lee agrees to that. Just to give you a concept, we're going to talk about Law's Alabamans here in a little while. They started their day in New Guilford. That's 20 plus miles to the west. They're going to march 20 miles, get here, and told, oh, guess what? We're going on a concealment march around the flank of the Union Army. Whew, that's a tough order, especially, especially when it's hot July day and smuggy. If you've been in Pennsylvania during the anniversary events, you would know that's, that's a tall order. And those poor Alabamans, man, they, they're really putting some work that day. But the inconvenient thing happens when Longstreet pops out where he's supposed to. He notices that that position that Sickles has moved out to with the third corps that I mentioned earlier, which is out there along the Emmitsburg Road and extending down here to Devil's Den. Sickles has uncovered his original position, what he was assigned to, which was Little Round Top, and now he has occupied his left flank over there on Devil's Den, not on Little Round Top. So now, what, instead of finding no one here that Lee had been told, now Longstreet has found an entire Union Corps, the Third Corps, right in this area. So Longstreet's going to modify his attack plan. He's going to have Hood, instead of McClaws, lead the attack. But in this case, he's going to extend Hood down Warfield Ridge there in the distance, that distant tree line and they're going to swing in kind of like a right hook to find the left of the Union line. All right. When that attack has developed and Hood's division is in contact with the Union flank, that's when McClaws is supposed to come across, across the Emmitsburg Road and crash into the Peach Orchard position. Once they have dismantled the Union position, they're to pivot and to move north because those are the orders. Remind you, the orders were to use the Emmitsburg Road as a guide to pivot and to head and outflank the Cemetery Hill position. 
Longstreet is fulfilling his orders. He's modified the attack plan a little, but he is still obeying the basically what is in, he's in charge of doing, is doing this. Understanding the attack on July 2nd in that way, because oftentimes we get caught in the east, west to east attacks, especially down here on Devil's Den. <laughs> but keep in mind that they're shifting. They're trying to outflank Cemetery Hill. And so that's their objective. People make a case, Hood is actually going to make a case of going over Round Top and getting into the rear of the Union Army. But to do that would have been a wild departure from the orders that Longstreet was given. Moreover, if you sent a division over Round Top not connected with the rest of the Army, okay, I mentioned, you find the five-pointed star, right? You know the 12th course here, first 11th course here. If you pull out your field glasses, you probably see the, tw the second corps as well. And now you know the third corps. You have accounted for five federal corps, infantry corps, but there are two left unaccounted for. You, and you don't know what's behind these ridges and these, behind these hills. You could have two Union Corps just hanging out back here. If you send John Bell Hood on a flanking maneuver over that hill, he could run into some real trouble. But that's a counterfactual. It never happened. So what's more important and what's more interesting to me is what actually did happen. So that's what's going on with the Confederates. What's going on with the Union forces? Okay. Sickles has moved out here without authorization. He moves to his new position. Meade has not given his approval. When Meade finds out, he's going to ride out with Sickles and have a conversation with him about this new position. Okay. When Meade does that, he is actually going to send this man, Governor Warren, Brigadier General, Chief Engineer of the Army of the Potomac, to take care of matters up here on Little Round Top. When Warren arrives, he notices that the only soldiers who are occupying this position are a Signal Corps detachment, guys with flags and a telescope who are communicating with other relay Signal Corps stations throughout the area. So what he's going to do is he's going to assess what's going on. And he's going to take care of matters up here. He's going to look out, and according to a story I like, is he's going to look out and see something, see that house back over there, that white house that I'm pointing to, and the car that's going along it. He sees over there something he doesn't like, or something that gives him pause. So he's going to send a message to the artillery battery commander down here on Hawks Ridge. Throw a couple of artillery rounds into that distant tree line. That message is sent. It's from a Brigadier General. Absolutely. That commander there goes, all right, loads them up and fires them into the distant tree line. How many here like baseball? <laughs> How many have been to a baseball game? What happens if you're sitting in a section when a foul ball comes into your section? You reflexively turn to look at it, right? Where it's going. Mm -hmm. The same idea applies here. The artillery round going into that distant tree line is going to cause, if there's anyone over there, to reflexively move to see where it's coming from. When they do that, any metal that they're wearing is going to reflect the sunlight and it's going to glint. So, Smith, the battery commander down there throws those artillery rounds in there and that distant tree line lights up. That's a problem. <laughs> That's a lot of Confederates about to come this way, and there are only a handful of Signal Corps guys up here, and the left flank is in the air down there. So Warren is going to start sending aides and orderlies everywhere he can, okay, to get any sort of help that he can. Eventually, things are gonna get so desperate that it's ranks and ranks of butternut and gray are descending over that field over there straight towards the left flank of the Union line. They're coming in. <laughs> it looks like nothing can stop them. So he gets so desperate that he himself is actually going to go down there and find some soldiers himself. I'll, t I'll take care of this too. We don't have the time for this. So I'm not saying that as an exact quote, but that's kind of the urgency here. So he's going down there and he'll actually meet up with the 140th New York and its commander, 
Colonel Patrick O'Rourke. And we'll talk about them next on the next stop. All right, great. <laughs> Patrick O'Rourke, a very fascinating guy. He was actually born in Ireland and he comes here and he attends the West Point Military Academy and graduates first in his class, in a class that's noted for the guy who finishes last. Custer. Yes, George Armstrong Custer. But Patrick O'Rourke is actually coming up here because when Meade finds out that Sickles has moved out, he's also going to send for the Fifth Corps. I was saying back at the other stop that you don't know if there's two corps behind here. There is, there's actually one corps. Not two corps, but there's one corps. There's the Fifth Corps in reserve. So Meade is going to send for the Fifth Corps, his old corps, to come up and to reinforce his Sickles line here that he has established. And as they're moving up, so is Patrick O'Rourke with the 3rd Brigade of the 2nd Division of the 5th Corps. This happens to be the brigade that Governor Warren had commanded earlier in the war. And he actually had commanded the 140th New York. He actually commanded them at the Battle of Fredericksburg. So he knows Patrick O'Rourke. He knows this unit. So he goes down there and he goes, Patty, I need your regiment. Patrick O'Rourke rightfully balks because Warren's no longer his commander. Warren's the chief engineer of the army. And Warren goes, never mind that. I'll take responsibility. Just come with me. So Patrick O'Rourke starts following him up with the 140th New York to reinforce this. At the same time, if we turn around, about that time also, Hazlitt's battery is starting to make its way up here as well. You can see their guns up there. And so forces are being sent to Little Round Top to help cover. But we will talk about the most famous force in just a little while. But before we do, let's turn around and look at this monument here, the 140th New York. It's a old tradition here at Gettysburg that for luck, People come up here and rub the nose of Patrick O'Rourke. That's why his nose is shiny. I think it's the luck of the Irish thing going on here. But uh, to spoil what's going on here, I don't know how much luck you're getting. Um, sorry, Patty, but, but he is killed on July 2nd. So it's one of those traditions I kind of find confusing. It's like, okay, I want luck. Let's go rub the nose of a guy who unfortunately, you know, well, Fortunately for us, gave his life here in service of his country, but it's an interesting concept. Um, there you go, 140th New York. That's it. Great. Okay, so let's go to our next stop. Come on, Finn. <laughs> I'm gonna be walking you all over the place here. <laughs> this is the castle monument to the 44th New York and the 12th New York Volunteer Infantry. They, this monument is actually designed by the Chief of Staff of the Army of the Potomac at Gettysburg, Daniel Butterfield. Butterfield was the original Colonel of the 12th New York. Uh, and so he's familiar with these guys. He will actually command the brigade that they have at, during the Seven Days Battles. Uh, for him, he designs this. It's, there's a lot of symbolism in this thing. It's about 44 feet tall. The tower is right above us. And the room in here is 12 by 12. So 44 and 12. You have a base relief of two commanders. Uh, Dan Butterfield himself is on the left there. And then you have Francis Channing Barlow on the right. Let's go see them. Yep. Come on, Finny. And then here you have Francis Chan. <laughs> but one of the famous photos that you ever have, that people actually propose to each other here, 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 is, is because you have this excellent view, this excellent shot of uh, this monument here. If you look, you've got some rosters of all the companies of these guys. Um, really an interesting. Interesting monument in a lot of ways. It's beautiful. 
But I love also the little detailings like the Maltese cross of the fifth core up here. If you want to know what a Maltese oh. cross looks like, that's what it is. Uh, Maltese cross of the fifth core. So yeah, so that's the 44 from New York. And down here, why they're doing rehabilitation efforts? Well, they're going to be closing it down for 12 to 18 months. This is one of the main reasons. Look at this. When this was new, the ground came up to the pavement. Oh, wow. Now look at it. You almost have to have a scaling ladder to get up here. Uh, so people have made so many social trails throughout this area that, and people have gotten off the path so much that it's caused a significant amount of erosion. So the National Park Service is going to be closing down Little Round Top to give some rehabilitation to it, to prevent the damage and to reconstruct the paths in order to make them more safe and more accessible. So that's kind of, you can see that. I love the monument to 44th New York, but you can also see why they're closing Little Round Top for as long as they are.